let me see here. The title, I always like to give the title to the uh, message before we get started, uh, so they'll know what to write down there in the back. Uh, but basically, the title is How to Receive by Faith. Hallelujah. Um, and if you will, pull up the scripture on, your, on the uh, screen back there about... Uh, you know, Lucifer said in his heart that he will exalt his throne above the Most High. If you can find that, I don't. That way, I won't have to search for it. It's funny. I had all these uh, scriptures lined up, and then as I drove in, the Lord said, "Start with that one." I was like, "Okay, <laughs> where is it?" <laughs> Hallelujah! All righty, praise the Lord. Well, we'll uh, we'll pray and get started. Oh, Father God, we thank you so much that we have the privilege to come together and to share from your Word. We thank you, sir, that. The Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church, and we just open ourselves this morning to receive from your word by your spirit. And Father, we just believe we will receive some things today that will impact our lives individually. We thank you, Father, for not only all the folks that are here, but also those that are watching over internet, uh, IPTV, and, and throughout the world. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, well, uh, trust they'll find that scripture back there. In the meantime, I'll just share the story. <laughs> uh, there is an incident reported in the scripture that talks about how Satan uh, decided he was going to elevate his throne above the Most High. Now, as we get into that, I want you to think about a couple of things. There's going to be some key phrases and words that we're going to bring out today as we, as we get into the Word. And kind of perk your ears up when you hear them. Faith, of course, goes without saying. Vision, insight, and uh, mental perception, maybe is a good phrase or way to put it. But uh, basically, I want you to think about this particular occurrence of what happened with Satan. Satan found himself, first of all, he at this time was not Satan. He was Lucifer. He was the anointed cherub. He was the one who uh, basically, you might say, well, let's put it this way, he worked for God, okay? He was on God's side. Uh, he was not created evil. He was, in fact, uh, an angel that was, um, had a very high level of authority, and he saw how God operated, okay? That's the part I want you to think about here. He saw how God operated. And so he said, notice, he said, I will exalt my throne above the Most High. I will, in other words, elevate myself to the position of God. Well, you think, how in the world could he have thought that, that would work? I mean, come on. We're talking God, and we're talking an angel. Now, the two key things I want you to think about in that particular incident and that is, Lucifer did not have the right to say, by faith. Okay? He also, obviously, did not have the right to elevate his throne above the Most High. Now, the thing that a lot of people miss about that particular scripture is, he had a throne. He had a throne. Matter of fact, the scripture says that he was, you might say, uh, I've heard it put this way, the, the leader of music in heaven. He was one who led worship and praise, and he led in music. There is also some scripture that, that would seem to indicate he had some authority over the world that then was. Okay? Meaning the earth, but it was the world that then was. This is before what happened in Genesis 1 verse 2. Okay? There was a world that was created, Satan had rule and reign over that world under God in, in correct authority. But then his fall created destruction on the earth. And when that happened, talk about Lucifer's fall when he fell, the destru uh, destruction came to the earth and God had to recreate the earth. Which is why he told Adam and Eve, replenish the earth. Now, if that particular teaching is, is blind to you, I encourage you to study it out. I will say this, I do not teach that as absolute doctrine, that that's the way it is and none other, but I have seen it in the Scripture, 
as being a fairly valid approach. It will not matter one whit whether you believe that or not as far as going to heaven. Amen. Understand that? has nothing to do with you going to heaven. It's just an interesting kind of a thing. However, this world that was, that Satan ruled over, he had a throne. Now again, under God's authority in the right lineage, if you will, of authority. He was not usurping his position by having that throne. But notice... Uh, what it says here in Isaiah 14, 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. And the word stars here is angels of God. I will sit also in the mount of the co um, congregation in the side of the north. Basically saying that he's going to elevate his throne above God. Now, that was his goal. That was his desire. And he said something ostensibly by faith. But guess what? He couldn't say it by faith because it was not according to the Word of God. Okay? He thought he was acting according to spiritual principles. Do you see what I'm saying? He had seen how God operates. He saw that God spoke words and they came to pass. He saw that he could get a vision in his heart and then bring that vision to pass according to the words that he spoke out of his mouth. He saw that system in motion and he thought, wow, if that system works the way I've seen it work, then I can say with my mouth that this is going to happen and it will come to pass. But he missed a couple of things. The couple of things he missed is he had no right. He was an angel. Only God and mankind has the right to use their words to cause things to come to pass. Did you get that? God made man in his own image. Satan was not made in God's image. When Satan was created, when he was formed, he was formed as an angel. An angelic being is not a human. Okay? And when we die, we don't become angels. A lot of people think that, and, and Hollywood likes to portray that in the old movies. You know, they don't, they don't make movies like that anymore. <laughs> but when they did, they falsely portrayed that people became angels when they died. That is not the case. An angel is a created being. They are unique. And they are messengers of God. They are sent to be uh, those who work on our behalf as heirs of salvation. So basically, there are, I don't put it too, you know, at a, too much at a lower level here, but we'll put it this way. They're the worker bees. <laughs> they get things done in the spirit realm, you know what I'm saying? For us, okay? So therefore, we do not worship them. We do not, now catch this, because this is a doctrine that was going around a little while ago. Uh, we don't call upon them directly. Amen. We do not address them directly. They hearken to the word of God that we speak out of our mouth. We don't have to address them. When they hear us speak the word, they go to work for us. Amen. That's their assignment, Amen. okay? So Satan's not even in the class that he could speak the word and have it come to pass. And of course, he wasn't speaking the word. He was speaking a lie. He was speaking his desire, his wrong desire, to elevate his throne above God. But he thought he was operating by faith. So A, he was the wrong kind of created being, an angel or an angelic type being. So he didn't have the right. He also couldn't have been speaking by faith because there's no faith in saying I'm going to exalt my throne above the most high. Matter of fact, I had, no listen to this closely, I have the right to speak the word of God and have it be a creative force. Absolutely. But do you know that I do not have the right to say I'm going to exalt my throne above the Most High? That's against the Word of God. That's against the plan of God. So even if I had the right, even if Satan had the right to speak and have things come to pass, he couldn't have succeeded with this. So he's wrong on at least two levels, probably more. <laughs> but for our purposes... That's far enough, okay? But here's what I want you to see about what Satan did here. He said, 
For thou hast said in thine heart. Notice he said in his heart. It was something he envisioned in his heart. Now, Satan saw in to a spiritual principle that he still to this day knows something about. Now, this is why I wanted to put it that way. There are a lot of false doctrines, false religions, uh, occult teachings, New Age teachings, all these kinds of things that talk about the power of getting a mental image. Okay? And they act like if you can get a mental image in your mind, and some of them even talk about talking that, talk what you have in your mental image in your mind, then it will come to pass. Well, the problem with that is there's nothing behind it empowering it. There's no power of God behind that. They somehow, as they teach it, they kind of teach it like, uh, it's just the power of your mind. Your willpower, you know, is going to bring that to pass. Well, uh, that won't work. That just won't work. The power of God is what's required to bring your words to pass if you speak them in line with the Word of God, okay? It's not your mind that does that. But your mind is involved. Now see, this is the point where the occult New Age teaching and the Bible part ways. Okay? And this is why when you teach along these lines that I'm teaching this morning, you kind of shift in your seat and go, yeah, I don't know, Brother Bill. I... That mental image stuff, that, that sounds a little too much like the occult or, or like New Agey doctrine, you know. And so people reject it. And they don't think about a mental image. But there is a sound biblical reason for having a right mental image concerning what you're believing for. Now the reason I brought up, and I didn't realize I was going to bring this up so I didn't have the scripture ready, uh, in Isaiah 14, 13, and 14. But the reason that I believe the Lord showed me that on the way in this morning is that's the origin of Satan having the understanding of a mental image and words being spoken about that mental image. And since he knew that then, he knows it now, and he teaches it in this false New Age teaching. You see what I'm saying? But it does not nullify the original, actual, correct teaching concerning getting a good mental image. All right? Hopefully, <laughs> you got that, and we can kind of go from there. All right? So, let's look at Proverbs 29. We'll get into the actual scripture I had written down now. <laughs> Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision... Here's that word. The people perish. Some uh, translations say the people fail. Some translations say are left naked. All of those are correct definitions. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. But now look at that. Where there is no vision. That's the Hebrew word shalzon. Okay? You know me, I like to go to the original languages and find out what it's talking about. The Hebrew word here is shalzon. It means mental sight or revelation. Mental sight. And that's what I want us to, to think about here this morning. When it comes to faith, you've got to get a mental sight. You've got to get an image. You've got to get a revelation of what it is you're believing for. Now here it says, where there is no mental sight or revelation, the people fail or perish. They come to nothing. They are left destitute and naked without that mental sight or that vision. Next verse, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Book of Habakkuk. That's not tobacco. <laughs> you know, when you're from North Carolina, you kind of kind of throw that in there. <laughs> Habakkuk. 
chapter 2, verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, the mental sight or revelation. Make it plain. Now, a couple of things I want us to see here. First of all, you have to have a mental sight. Then it says you need to write it down. And it says you need to make it plain. Well, what does that mean? It means plan. Now, a lot of people <laughs> may think, wow, he's done, he's done left the reservation here. You going to plan to operate by faith? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You need to plan your operation of faith. You need to take the time to get a clear mental sight or vision of your goal, of what you're believing for, what you're trying to achieve in the spirit realm. Then you need to write it down. Now, I know, you know, we were talking about the New Year's Eve service, and one of the things that uh, came out one New Year's Eve in particular was that we needed to write down uh, on New Year's Eve all the things we were going to believe for, all the goals we had for the year, but then put our faith on it, and then by the next New Year's Eve, go back and look how many had come to pass, scratch those off, and write down some more and keep that going. I heard a lot of people teach that at one point, but somehow we kind of let that slip. You need to write it down. It says, write the vision, make it plain upon tables. We, today, we'd say on paper. That he may run that readeth it. So that means you've got to read it. Once you write it, a lot of people write it down, then they forget it until next year. <laughs> no. Write it down and read it. Go over the vision. Refresh it. But now notice what it says. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. That word appointed time in Hebrew is moed. It is an appointed time. At the end of the vision, the manifestation, it will speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it. That doesn't mean just wait and twiddle your thumbs. That means continue to stand fast, believe God, be in the operation of patience. You know, patience doesn't mean laying down and letting the devil run over you like over a, a rug. No. Patience is to be consistently the same way all the time. Amen. Consistency. So, be consistent because it, the vision that you've written down, will surely come, it will not tarry. Alright? Now, all of that was to get us to Hebrews chapter 11. That's where I want to spend a little bit of time here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And this is very, very familiar scripture. This is, this is, this is stuff that's just refresher course to you here. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith. Well, that we're talking about now faith. We're not talking about then faith. We're talking, not talking about was faith. <laughs> we're talk, not talking about to be faith in the future. We're talking about now faith. Now, I know that the word now can be used as the beginning of a sentence, you know, like you say, now then, folks. You know what I'm saying? But the way this is structured in the Greek, now faith is faith in the present tense. All right? It is present tense faith. That is the substance of things hoped for. Now, this word hope is what corresponds with what we saw earlier about mental vision. Okay? Now, I'm going to take just a second and let that sink in. Hope is the mental vision. If you don't have the mental vision, if you haven't made it plain, there is nothing for faith to give substance to. Did you get that? It would be like me telling Brother Larry, Brother Larry, go build me a car. And he says, all right, Brother Bill, I'll go build you a car. Uh, what kind of car? Well, yeah, I don't know. Uh, how many wheels is it going to have? I don't know. What kind of engine is it going to have? I don't know. In other words, you haven't made any plans. You're just going to take a bunch of junk and throw it together and say, there's your car. How well will that work? It won't work at all. 
So you've got to plan your work and work your plan. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's wisdom when it comes to the natural world as well as it is to the spiritual world. Right. Plan your work, work your plan. All right? You've got to have a mental vision. You've got to have a plan. Now, I'm not talking about planning out how you're going to get healed. I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to get healed. Okay? No. But you can get a vision of health. You can get a vision of yourself well. You can get a vision, if you're laying in bed, of you up out of bed and walking. You can get a mental picture, an image, a vision of the desired end result. And if you have a picture of the desired end result, then your faith has some, something that it can give substance to. Amen. See what we're saying? Amen. So if we take this scripture apart, now faith is the substance, and actually the Greek here is very interesting. It says the giving of substance to. So let's read it that way. Faith is the giving of substance to the things you have a mental image of that you have conceived in your mind. Hope. Now this word hope is the word elpis. It's actually translated uh, depending on what, where it is in the scripture and how it's used. It's either the word elpis or elpizo. All right? and it depends on the tense and so forth. But listen to what it means. To anticipate. What do you anticipate with? With your mental vision. Right? Usually, now this is the key part to me, usually with pleasure expectation and confidence. So this is a, I like to put it this way, this is a constant favorable expectation or anticipation. Okay? That's what this word hope is. Other places in the Bible, in the King James Bible, the same word is translated trust. In other words, we're to trust in God. We're to have a confident pleasurable expectation or anticipation concerning our outcome. Why? Because God said, my thoughts toward you are thoughts of your success, not of your failure. Amen? Amen. God wants you to succeed. Amen. He wants you blessed. Amen. He has no interest in you being in pain. He has no interest in you being sick. He is the Lord that healeth thee. He's the Lord that delivers you. He is the Lord who provides your needs. He's not the one who taketh away. Okay? And, it, you know, I like what Pastor said a few Sundays ago when he was teaching. He was talking about Jesus going around the villages healing. He said, you know, if Jesus was constantly doing the will of the Father and doing only what he saw the Father do, somewhere at some point you'd have thought he'd have walked into a town and laid hands on somebody and said, get cancer. I mean, if that was really God's will, and he was doing God's will, you would think at some point in all of his ministry, he would have laid hands on somebody and made them sick. But you know he never did. Everybody he laid hands on got healed. So healing is the demonstrated will of God. Did you get that? Healing is the demonstrated by Jesus will of God. Prosperity and meeting people's needs is the demonstrated by Jesus because he provided tax money. You remember for the disciples? He said, go fishing. Take the, ta the money out of the mouth of the first fish. Provision. Uh, he multiplied the bread, gave it out to the disciples who gave it to the people. Provision. Constantly providing, constantly giving to People, I, I heard a message by uh, Pastor Keith Moore this morning, and he was teaching. And he was talking about a pastor friend of his. And this particular pastor uh, had been teaching something in his church that his church didn't like. You know, but it was the Word of God. It was, it was accurate. But some of his people didn't like what he was teaching. And so this, this well-dressed man came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I don't like what you're teaching. And if you don't quit teaching that, I'm going to take my money, my tithe, and my family and leave the church. 
And the pastor said, well, brother, I, you know, I'm sorry you don't like what I'm teaching, but it's Bible. He says, I know it's Bible, but I don't like it. And you shouldn't be preaching it, because I don't like it. And he said, well, I can't, I can't preach something, you know, not preach something just because you don't like it. So sure enough, the guy left the church, took his money and left. Well, the pastor watched him go, and he prayed and he said, Lord, there goes the biggest giver in the church. And the Lord said to the pastor, no, I'm still here. I went, yeah, <laughs> amen. But I notice that. The Lord said, I'm still here. I'm the biggest giver. He provided Jesus, his only son. My goodness, he's the biggest giver. Not to mention all that he's been doing to bless us and so forth and so on. I mean, wow. So he is the biggest giver. He's the one who is the example of giving. He's the one Jesus saw do what he did, and then Jesus went and did that. Amen. Okay? So Jesus did the example of the Father God. So we know God's nature is to be a giver. He is one who loves his children. He wants what's best for us. So we have a constant, favorable anticipation or expectation in life. A lot of people, I've had people tell me, I had a guy at work, as a matter of fact, tell me, he says, Dr. Bill, uh, you're just too nice. You're just too upbeat. You know, occasionally it'd be nice to hear you just grumble a bit, you know? And I said, well, that's yeah, just not my nature. You know, I, did, I didn't want to get into a whole big thing. But I said, it's not my nature. Why? Because I got the nature of the Lord. That's the nature of Jesus. And uh, so he said, yeah, but you know, people around here think you're a nut. I said, well, that's all right. I am a nut. I'm a fanatic and getting more fanatical. Amen. He said, but don't you know that that might hurt you in your, uh, in your business uh, affairs and, and people, they, you may not get promotion and all that. I said, well, my promotion comes from the Lord. Amen. Amen. It doesn't matter. I don't have to fit in to the world system. Matter of fact, I'm called upon specifically not to fit into the world system. Okay? So they watch me succeed and prosper in spite of the fact that I'm not acting like they think I ought to act. I'm not fitting in. So I have a constant favorable expectation or anticipation. Now, let's keep going here. Faith is the giving of substance of this constant favorable anticipation or expectation for the evidence... Now that word evidence is evidence that stands up in court of things not seen. Notice, not seen with the natural eye. So if you can't see it with the natural eye, here's the part I want you to get. If you can't see it with the natural eye, you need to see it with the spiritual eye. Amen. You need to see it in your spirit. Yes. You need to see it in your heart. It's got to be a vision that you have in your heart, not literal eye vision, but spirit vision. I like what I heard Brother Copeland say one time here recently. He was talking about reading the Bible and studying things in the Word of God, and uh, I think it was him and, and David Barton on, on uh, his, uh, his TV program, and they were talking along, and Brother Copeland said, that doesn't make sense, it makes faith, what he was saying. A lot of people would look at it and say, that make, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make the five physical senses. It doesn't make seeing and hearing and touching and tasting and all those things. It makes faith. Faith has a sense. Faith has an ability that we haven't thought about very much. Faith has an internal vision. And that's what I want us to do is get an internal vision of what it is we're believing for so that faith can give substance to that thing. Okay? So, keep reading here. Uh, it is the evidence of things we don't see with the natural eyes, for by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now, let me just put this this way. If you go to the doctor and get a bad report, then that bad report did not come through faith. Okay? It may have come by one of the five physical senses, but it didn't come by the faith sense. So the good report comes by the faith sense. 
And there are times, I was confronted with this uh, when Ben was born, and they said that Belinda had to have a heart transplant. And they told me she would probably die without one. Matter of fact, they said she would die without one, but they were hoping they could find a donor heart and get it in there, and that they wanted her to meet with the heart transplant team and get all that rolling. And she was standing in faith. But it didn't make sense for her to be believing God because her heart was failing. It had gotten enlarged and it wasn't pumping blood right. It was postpartum cardiomyopathy. And literally, she was dying. She, you know, water fluids were building up in her and she was swelling up and she was weak and she couldn't get out of bed and so forth and so on. It didn't look good. Our senses told us, and the doctor's test told us, a bad report. Matter of fact, a terrible report. But the Word, through our faith sense, gave us a good report. Gave us a report of healing. Gave us a report of her being made totally well and whole. Pastor and I and, and Pastor Janie prayed. Belinda read her faith cards that Pastor Janie provided and built herself up in the Word of God. And she was already in the Word. I mean, you know, before all this happened. And then, within two weeks, she went home. Completely well. And to this day, when she goes back for heart tests, they have to go every year, you know, and test things, put her on the treadmill, and hook her up to the wires and all that kind of stuff. And they test her and they say, you know, there's just no evidence that she ever had any kind of heart condition. Now that's the healing power of God. But had we believed and, and received and accepted the bad report from the physical senses, the outcome would not have been the same. You see what I'm saying? We had to have a higher report. We had to have a good report. How did the elders obtain a good report? They did it by faith. They used their faith sense. And that's what we got to do today. We got to use our faith sense. We've got to not believe the bad report. We look around us at the world today and the financial situation. Oh my goodness, it's easy to believe a bad report. But we got to use our faith sense. Not our what we see over the TV sense. Not what we see on the news sense or hear from the financial realm or Wall Street. We don't buy that. We don't buy into that. We see for ourselves only good things. Only a good report. And we have to do that by our faith sense. Amen? You get this? Hallelujah. Through faith, or by means of faith, we understand that the worlds, the natural worlds, earth, planets, so forth, were framed by the Word of God. In other words, He spoke words, and those things were slung into existence. So that the things which we see with our natural eyes were not made of things which we see with our natural eyes. Did you get that? The things we see around us, when I pick up this glass, this glass was made out of something natural. It had a natural, you know, it was sand that was fired, turned into glass, blown, I don't know, whatever, formed in some way into this glass. So it was made from things which do appear. But what we see by the faith sense is not made of things which do appear. It's made of a substance that we call faith. The faith sense exercises the faith substance to cause things to come to pass. In other words, we pull it from another realm. We pull it out of the spiritual realm into the natural realm. We see things come to pass before they do. We speak what we desire to see coming to pass before it does. And it becomes. Amen. Amen. Alright, so, through faith, by means of faith, we understand that the worlds were framed, constructed, formed by the words of God or, as it says here, singular, the Word of God. Jesus is the Word made flesh. Amen. And we have the Word. We can read it. We can study it. The Word of God. So that the things which we see 
we're not made of things which do appear to the natural senses. All right. Let's, uh, let's back up to this word hoped because I want us to, what I'm primarily trying to get to is here, I believe we have dropped something important in these steps of operating in faith. And the key to it that I want us to see is this point of the mental vision, the sight, the hope part. I've even heard people say, now, I understand what they mean by it, okay? Don't get me wrong. But I've heard people say, hoping and praying won't get it done. You have to believe God. That's true. But you got to have some hope before you pray. I've also heard this. People talk about people in the hospital, and they say, oh, don't get their hopes up, brother. Now, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to get their hopes up. Because if they don't have the mental sight, if they don't have the vision of health, there's nothing for their faith, if you can ever get them faith, there's nothing for their faith to give substance to. Now, I'm about to say something here that's going to shock some folks. There are Christians, good, sound, word of faith Christians, who have died and they had faith. But they had no hope. Did you get that? Man, that's one you need to write down somewhere and meditate on. That's a good one, Lord. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Now, I'll tell you this. I, I don't, a lot of you may not know this, but I was married before Belinda to a lady. Her name was Joy. And uh, we were married right out of college. And she died of cancer. Now, she went to all the same meetings that I went to. She heard Brother Copeland, just like I did. She went to all the same Bible studies. She heard me preach. She heard Brother Hagin preach. She heard Gloria preach. She heard all the things that we heard. We all collectively heard. And she believed it. And as a matter of fact, when she first got breast cancer, she stood on the Word and was healed and stayed healed for two years until it reoccurred. You know, Satan sometimes won't leave you alone. Just because you had a victory, he'll come back. And she, to put it mildly, <laughs> she freaked out. Now why? Because her mother had died of cancer, and she had always been in fear concerning cancer. She was always talking, oh, I hope I don't get cancer. And I'd tell her, you know, you need to stay in faith over this. This is before it was ever manifested. Well, yeah, I know that, I know that. But she was always afraid and that which she so greatly feared came upon her. Right. I mean, these are all spiritual truths, folks. These work. And so if, if you don't work it, or if, you know, in this case, you do work it, depending on how you look at it, uh, you end up with those results. And it's, it's a shame. But she got to the point she got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and finally got to the point I tried to play tapes for her. She didn't want, want me to play tapes. I tried to play... We, we got a videotape by Brother Hagen called Seven Things You Need to Know About Healing. And I wanted to play that tape at night while she laid there and just let her absorb the word. And she said, no, I don't want to hear it. And I said, why don't you want to hear it? She said, it makes me afraid because it reminds me I'm sick. She's laying in bed with cancer, dying, and yet she says, I, I don't want it to remind me I'm sick. That's just deception. But my reaction as a believer... Husband doing the best I could, trying to deal with it. My reaction was to kind of coddle her. Okay, well, all right. Just kind of let it go, you know. And the Lord got all over me one day. I'll never forget, it was a Sunday morning. And she was in bed, couldn't even get out of bed. Matter of fact, she couldn't even turn herself over at this point. Uh, had to do that. And she's laying there in bed, and... I just didn't go to church this particular Sunday morning, and uh, the Lord just got all over me, and he said, you know, if she doesn't straighten up and believe the Word of God, she's going to die. And I said, yeah. He said, you need to go in there and confront her and have her make a decision. Well, I didn't want to do that. You know, I'm just not a confrontational kind of guy. 
But I said, well, Lord, I mean, you, you said do it. I'm going to do it. So I went in there. I said, listen, the Lord just told me if you don't get on the Word of God and start hearing the Word of God, you're going to die. Just as straight as I could. She just looked up at me and said, I know it. And I'm tired of fighting. I just want to go home. And I went, what? I mean, this was outside my, my realm of thinking. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm a faith man. You know, I, I don't think of, I'm just going to quit and go home kind of thing. I'm always wanting to fight for life, you know? And so I went, what? I mean, that was not the result I expected. But within less than an hour, she began to fail quickly. Now, before this, she was getting slightly better, a little bit better, a little bit better. But after she made this decision, she just immediately reversed and was going straight downhill to the point she was having a hard time breathing. I thought, man, I got to get to the hospital. So I, I started trying to get her to the car. She said, don't worry with it, don't worry with it. I said, come on. Got her physically, had to almost pick her up and take her to the car, put her in the car, drive into the hospital. I'm holding on to her hand saying, hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. And she just dropped her head over, and that was it. She was gone. I get to the hospital. I go running to the hospital. I said, my wife's out in the car. You got to come. And they come out and look, and you have to exchange those, these looks. Uh, okay. Uh, you, you better go sit in there. So they take her in, and they zap her, and they pump things, and they shoot her full of stuff. She didn't respond. And she was gone. And oh, my goodness, I was, I was shocked. I was shocked. I said, how could this happen? And the Lord said, well, she had to make a decision. She made it. She went home. And I went, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess that's what happened. But now it was not, you know, the finest hour of faith, shall we say. That was not the outcome I was looking for at the time. Now, switch over to years later, many years later. Belinda's in the hospital. The doctors come with a bad report. What do you think Satan wants to paint in my mind? See? You done lost one wife, you're going to lose another one. I got you right where I want you. Now, listen to this. As a faith minister, I hesitate to say this, particularly since it's on the Internet and video, but a whole lot of faith people who invited me to come teach, they quit inviting me. Because my wife died. How dare he come preach me faith when his wife died? Uh-oh. But see, folks, it's, it's not up to me whether you live or die. It's up to what you receive. Amen. I could be hottest preacher on the planet and preach you the Word of God. You could still die. Amen. But see, what's the difference? She Now, I know for a fact that she had faith. Joy had faith. She had no hope. Her hope for healing was not there. Now, her hope for heaven was strong. Her belief in going home and be with the Lord was strong because she said, I just want to go home. I'm tired of this fight. I want to go home. And she went home. And that's where she is. So you know what? She still won. Amen. Amen. But now... As far as God's man of faith and power, that appeared to be a failure. So many years later again, my expectation and mental vision that Satan tried to paint for me was, it's happening again. It's happening again. And I had to fight that tooth and nail every single day. Now keep in mind, Ben had just been born. I was having to take him to and from the hospital for those two weeks so Belinda could see him as a baby, I'm taking care of him and going to work <laughs> and taking him to see her in the hospital. And there was a lot of pressure to just kind of cave. But I said, no, no, I do not receive that. I kept my mouth straight. And then two weeks later, like I said, complete turnaround. She comes home healed. And it was such a, a marvelous and exciting testimony that Brother Copeland sent a, a team of folks to come film the testimony and put it on his TV show back in 1993, I believe it was. And, uh, you know, you can, we've got the video out there now where you can see that video of her testimony. So a completely different result because Belinda's 
difference is she not only had faith because she'd heard the Word of God, she had hope because she had developed an image in her heart, I'm going home, I'm going to take care of my baby, and all will be well with me. She never said anything different from that. She said, I'm going home soon. The doctor was going, no, you're not. I'm going to be fine. No, you're not. You need a heart transplant. I'll do. And they're, they're like, is there something wrong with you? Is there something? Do you not understand? I mean, they would almost paint it darker because they wanted her to get it. They wanted to understand the condition she was in. And she was just looking at them like, you guys don't understand. I've got a good report, not your bad report. I've got, I see it by the faith sight. I'm not listening to you. I'm listening to the Word. And so we got her a, a little miniature TV that she had in her hospital room. She watched Brother Copeland's program. And she listened to tapes. And she read those scripture cards. And she just surrounded herself with the Word of God and got healed. It's a better outcome. Much better outcome. Now, praise the Lord, you know, if, you, if you're wanting to go home, well, that's fine, but don't go home sick. Amen. Go home well. Amen. You know, live until you're satisfied, then just check out. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, uh, this word hope. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Romans chapter 8. For we are saved by hope. Now, this is the same word hope or elpis that we're talking about here. We're saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. That's another one of those stop meditate points. Sala moments. Hope that is seen with the natural eye is not hope. What we see with the natural eye is called manifestation. All right? But hope is not seen with the natural eye. It is higher than what you see with your natural eye. It comes from the faith sense. Let's read it that way. For we're saved by this expectation, constant favorable expectation or anticipation. But this favorable expectation that is seen with the natural eye is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? I put the it in there for understanding purposes. <laughs> If you see it with a natural eye, what are you doing hoping for it? There's no need to hope for something you see with your natural eye. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience, who pomene in the Greek, wait for it. In other words, as Jerry Savelle once said, there's some time between the amen and the there it is. Okay? <laughs> there's time between the amen... And the there it is. And what you do in that interval between the amen and the there it is, is called living by faith. Amen. Is called staying in patience. Amen. Consistently the same way all the time. Who pulminate. Constant, favorable anticipation and expectation, that's hope. And then being consistently the same way, believing that that constant, favorable anticipation or expectation is what will come to pass. We hope for what we see not yet. Let's put it that way. What we don't see yet. But we with this constant, favorable anticipation or hope with patience wait for it. Period of time between the amen and there it is. We wait for it. Mm, that's good stuff. Now, 1 Timothy 6, let's look there. This is a little different approach. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust. The word trust there is the same word, elpis or elpizo, that we, it is translated hope. So let's read it as hope instead of trust, because like I said, it can be translated two different ways, and so we can use that. Nor hope in uncertain riches. See, that what he's telling the rich folks here is, don't put your hopes in the finances. Don't put your hopes in the financial realm. If I had to be settled in my finances based on what I saw going on in the stock market right now, <laughs> you know, that's why people jumped out of buildings during the Great Depression. 
because they trusted in their riches or they hoped their mental vision of their future was in their riches. Their mental vision of success was in their natural wealth and possessions. That's not where ours is supposed to be. Our expectation and anticipation of favorable things should be in the Lord and in our faith sight, not in what we see in the natural. So he says here, charge them that are rich in this world, because see, if they're rich, they have the finances to trust in. You know, it's easier sometimes not to trust in financial riches if you don't have them. <laughs> That's not an, an excuse to not have them. But obviously, if you don't have it in the bank, you're not trusting in it. You know, you may be trusting in the desire to have it, <laughs> but you're not having to, you know, you're not having to be charged, hey guys, don't put all your faith in your money, which is what he's saying here. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who does what? He gives us all things richly to enjoy. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. In other words, God's our provision. God's our provider. God's the one who healed Belinda. Not the doctors. Now bless their hearts, they did the best they could. They knew all they, they knew to do, but that wasn't enough. And they freely admitted it wasn't enough. And the doctor, after she came back healed, and he ran all the tests, he wrote in a letter that we gave to Brother Copeland's people and they put on TV. And that letter said very plainly, this is a miracle of God. This is the doctor, the cardiologist. That happened because of faith. That happened because of God. It didn't happen because of the natural. It didn't happen because of the doctors. It didn't happen because of science. Now, that's not anything against doctors or science or medicine. That's all great stuff. And it can be of benefit. But not as much benefit as God. So you should put your faith and your trust and your favorable expectation in God. All right. Charge them that are rich in this world, they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who God gives us richly all things to enjoy. Well, that ought to put to rest the whole notion that God's out there trying to make you sick, trying to take everything you got, trying to, you know, wreck your car, and all that kind of mess he gets blamed for. You know, God gets blamed for a whole lot. But my goodness, he's not behind any of it. Satan's the one that has come to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. All right. One last thing here I want us to look at, and that is Mark 11. You can't, <laughs> can't teach on faith without going to Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. Mark 11, 22. We'll close with this. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Now notice, some translations say, have the God kind of faith. Some say, have the faith of God. What did we say about the devil early on? He didn't have right to the faith of God. Guess what? We have rights to the faith of God. Jesus said, have God's faith. He gave us right to use God's faith. So that makes us different than the devil. Hallelujah. Satan didn't have right to do it. We do. Let's keep going. He said, Have faith in God, for verily I say, words, speaking, unto you, that whosoever... How many whosoever's? Oh, yeah, we got some whosoever's. I'm a whosoever. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed. So he's speaking to the mountain. Be thou cast into the sea. And shall not doubt in his heart, the word doubt there I've said many times before is the Greek word diakrino. It means to differ, to separate thoroughly. In other words, make sure what's in your heart doesn't differ from what you're saying out of your mouth. That's because you've got the right mental sight in your heart. And that's what you're speaking and that's what you're saying. And shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. That's between amen and there it is. It's coming to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, 
This is the part that I saw that got me off on this study. <laughs> Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, them what? Them things, and ye shall have them. Now I realize it's not good English, but it gets the point across. Ye shall have them. Now the word have here. This is what I got off on. Now you know me, I said earlier I love to look up the Greek and the Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. And I looked up this word, and I did something different. I don't know other than the Holy Spirit why I did this. I didn't just look up the word, I looked up its derivative, what it came from. I don't always do that. But this time I felt very strongly prompted to do that. So the original word here is the word estomahi, transliterated, the pronunciation E-S-O-M-A-H-E-E, -E, estomahi, is the future tense of G-1510. Now G-1510 is what we're going to go to in just a minute in the Strong's nomenclature. It means G-1510 G will be or shall or shall come to pass in other words, what will be? You shall have in the future tense. So the Lord prompted me, go look at that original word. I went, okay. The original word is I-me. I-M-E-E, -E, I-me. G-1510. Now listen to this definition. First person singular present indicative. Wow. <laughs> First person, that's me. Singular, still me, present, <laughs> indicative. Oh, wow. A prolonged form of a primary and defective verb, which means I exist, used only when emphatic. In other words, you can put it this way. When you say I, me, and I love the way it, it actually comes out. That's the pronunciation, I, me, I, me. Me, Tarzan. No, I, me. When you say it, you have to say it emphatically, and it's in the present tense, and it is, I exist. Okay? Now, are you familiar with the old phrase, uh, I think, therefore I am? That's kind of, kind of the kind of thing it's talking about here. I am, meaning I exist right now. Well, this other word that's used in t uh, verse 24 is the future tense of that word. It means, I will exist. And this is what the Lord said. Are you ready? He said, if you will get a mental image and you will speak my word, you will be made to exist in the future you paint with your mental image. I went, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> You're telling me if I can get an image of myself a certain way, and I can get that image from the Word of God, and I stand on the Word and I speak that Word, that I'll be transferred into that reality, in effect. And I told Belinda this, I shared it with her when I was studying it, and she said, that sounds science fiction-y. <laughs> And I said, yeah, it does. And of course, I'm a science fiction fan, so I kind of identified with that. I'll get transferred into that existence. You know, just like the old Star Trek transporter. And I'm in that new world. If I can get an image, and I can get it in my heart, and I can develop that mental image, and I can bring faith to bear to cause that thing to come to pass, I will be made to exist in that world. Another translation puts it this way. If you don't have what you're bleeding for, I'll make it. Amen. So if what you need, whether it's you being totally healed, whether it's your financial turnaround, whether it's you getting a new job, whatever it may be, if you can see yourself there, if you can get the mental sight, put your faith on it, stand for it, operate in patience, then you will find yourself there. Now I'll tell you 
very quickly a personal example of this. Many years ago, when I was in full-time ministry, uh, I was believing for an office. I wanted an office. And I, I didn't have room in my house for a, an office, a, a good one. And I wanted to build an office out behind my house. I had the property there. I could do it. And so I began to draw up plans. I wanted a radio studio because I was on radio at the time. I wanted a workroom where I could put together my newsletter. I wanted a nice big office with a desk and a chair. And I wrote all that out. I drew out all the plans. I put it on paper. And as a matter of fact, I, I, didn't, I didn't do this. I should have. Uh, I, I studied all the of uh, Mark 11:24 out in detail in the Greek. And this is what it says. But shall believe that those things which he says shall come into being, he shall have, will be, or taken from the future place of that thing's existence, of whatever he has spoken. Therefore, what things soever you ask, beg, call, crave, desire, or require, believe that you actively take, lay hold on, lay siege of, those things and they will be come into existence or shall be made actively to come to pass. Wow. See, part of that is, you know, Gloria Copeland talks about uh, faith seizes. Faith takes hold of. It's not passive. And that's exactly what the Greek word here says. It says, actively take, lay hold on, seize. In other words, you have to actively take it. Not just lay back and go, oh Lord, I hope it comes to pass. No, you have to actively take it with your faith. And so I drew all this out, and part of the meaning of this word where he says uh, say it, the word say, part of the meaning of that word is to write it down, which I thought was really deep, because we read earlier that we need to write the vision make it plain. So write it down. So that's what I did with this office. I wrote it down, I made my plans, I laid them out. I put my hands on them. I, boy, I just, I was going after it every way I could in faith. Didn't have the money, didn't have the materials, but was believing for the office. And the Lord dealt with me to do this. I, I, I actually felt a little funny doing it because like I said in the first part of this message about new age kind of thinking, I pictured myself in my office. I pictured myself leaning back in my comfortable chair. I pictured myself writing at my desk. I saw myself in that reality. A couple of years later, after building the building, the money coming in totally by faith, didn't know a dime on it. I'm sitting in my office in my chair, leaning back, and all of a sudden the Lord said, do you remember when you had the vision of this? Do you remember seeing yourself sitting in this office? Do you remember seeing yourself leaning back in this comfortable chair? And I went, yeah, I remember that. He said, and it came to pass. And I went, yeah. And that's how it works. You get a mental sight. You put faith on that mental sight. The faith causes it to come to pass, and you are translated into that reality. It comes to pass. And then you look back on it and go, wow. See, I look back on Belinda's healing, and you know, the devil doesn't bother me about her healing. He never comes back and says, what if she dies? Because she's been healed. She's well. All the results are perfectly fine. I mean, even in the natural. They're fine. So he doesn't bug me about that. Now, he bugs me about other things. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But see, I got to get a mental sight of that too. I got to get a vision, just like we did for her healing. And now that it's come to pass, it has come to pass. I don't have to have constant favorable hope and expectation she'll be healed of a heart problem because she's already been healed of the heart problem. She's well, she's whole, she's fine. She's living in divine health. Okay? So, now that doesn't mean get lax in your faith. But I'm saying, once you've, once you've won the battle, now you enjoy the spoils. Now you enjoy the winning. And that's what we do. Praise God.
Get anything out of this this morning? Woo, hallelujah. I like that. Get translated into that reality. Praise God. See, you got to see it. You got to see it. You got to see it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, my. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you shared with us this morning from your word. Father, we thank you that you are giving us vision. You're giving us a mental sight of what we should do and how we should do it in our personal lives, in individual things, Father, and in the church, things that you have for us to do here as well. We thank you, Father, that we've heard the word of God, we've heard the word, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so now we are empowered for that to come to pass and translate us into that reality. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.